This morning I want us to begin a new series. We're going to study the book of Ephesians. So turn with me, if you would, to the book of Ephesians this morning. And as we look at the book of Ephesians, if I had to come up with a theme verse, and maybe, maybe my theme verse will be different when we finish the book, but right now I would say it's in chapter 4 and verse 1 where it says, Walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. I think that's the theme idea. That's the main idea. Paul says, I want you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. So as you think about the book, divide the book into two parts. It has six chapters. The first three chapters we'll talk about that's your calling. In other words, what has God done in the life of a believer? He has called you. He has given you blessings. You're in a position of great blessing. And because of that, then chapters 4, 5, and 6, the second half of the book, then how do you walk? In other words, how do you live? So the first three chapters, he talks about what God has done for the believer. Then the last three chapters, so this is how you're to live. Walk in a manner worthy of your calling. That's how I would divide the book. So the first three chapters, he's going to talk about your calling. And this morning in chapter 1, he's going to talk about the work of God in salvation. Now, when we study something like this, there is a practicality, there's a relevance to us. And I want us to see that because this, I hope, is not just a, a dry theological lecture. Not that I think theological lectures are dry anyway. But maybe some of you don't think always like me. So, why would this be relevant? And I'm thinking there's a verse, there's a passage in the book of Joshua where Joshua is going to be the leader of the nation Israel. Moses had died, Joshua was going to take them into the promised land. And what does God say to Joshua? He says, my servant Moses is dead. Now therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people to the land which I am giving to them to the sons of Israel. Then he says, every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you. Just as I spoke to Moses from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. So he tells him, I've, I've already given you all the land. And then he says, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. So he says, nobody's going to be able to stand before you. I've been with Moses and I will be with you. He gives him this great assurance, I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. In other words, what he's saying is that I have given you the land. What he's saying is I have given you the victory. And now go forth and take possession. In other words, Joshua doesn't have to pray that God would give him the land. God has already given him the land. He doesn't have to pray God would give him the land. He just needs to enter in and take possession of the land. Joshua doesn't have to pray that God would give him the victory. God has already promised to give him the victory. All he has to do is go and fight for the Lord. You see, God's already promised the victory. God's already promised the land, but he's telling Joshua, lead the people. And what I want us to see here is that God has done great things in the life of the Christian. So the Christian doesn't need to pray that God would do certain things that he's already done. The Christian needs to now just enter into the possession of what God has already given to him. So when we think about walk in a manner worthy of your calling, the first part of the book, he describes the calling. 
He describes the great calling where the Christian has been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He says God has provided already all that you need to walk the Christian life and he has promised that he will never leave you nor will he ever forsake you and he's promised that he has sealed you unto the day of redemption. God has already made the promises. Now what he's saying is walk and live the life. And so this morning let's talk about, let's see what God has done first of all with regard to salvation. So let's begin in chapter 1 verse 1, the introduction, the Apostle Paul introduces himself, he tells us about the recipients of the letter, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, so he identifies himself, he says, by the will of God, God is the one who chose me to be an apostle, to the saints, and I don't want us to miss that, it's easy just to gloss over that, but he says, to the saints, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful, or you could translate it, who believe in Christ Jesus. But do you know, if I ask you, are you a saint, there'd be some of you who might say, well, you know, not really. I, I sometimes do things I wish I didn't, and uh, you know, I lose my temper sometime. You know what, from a biblical perspective, that's not the definition of a saint. The Bible says when you've trusted in Christ, you are a saint. The Bible says when you've trusted in Christ, your sins have been paid for. Remember we talk about that famous verse, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When you trust in Christ, sins have been taken away. So by position, when you trust in Christ, you are a saint. You are a saint and that's part of your calling. And so Paul addresses not just the leaders, not just some spiritual few, not just some elite. He's talking to the whole church and he says to the saints. So he says to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father in the Lord Jesus Christ. So he extends this grace, and grace is a big word in the book of Ephesians. Actually, grace is a big word in the Bible. But the word grace means unmerited favor, where the favor, the blessing, the kindness of God is extended toward them. So we know who wrote the letter, we know who received the letter, and they are saints, and that's part of their calling. Now verses three through 14, believe it or not, in Greek are one sentence. One commentator said it's one of the most difficult, cumbersome sentences in all of the Greek language. And I think that's certainly possible. And I thought, well, you could divide this up into three messages, but if it's one sentence, let's just do one message. Now, if we do one message, we won't plumb the depths of, the, of, of each one of the sections, but it talks about the work of God in salvation. Often when we think of salvation, we think about what we do. But really what the Bible says is God does the work. God does the work, we receive it. And it talks about God and it describes our God as a triune God and it's God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit and each one has a unique part to play in the work of salvation. And so he's going to talk about the three and the work that each individual member of the Godhead did. So let's begin in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And really this is almost like a psalm. It's almost a bit of a poem here. And the main point here is it says that you should bless God. So what do I want you to do when you go away from here this morning? First of all, I want you to bless God. I want you to thank God. I want you to praise God because God is the one who's the subject of the action. He has done great things. So he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In other words, he's saying to begin with that God the Father, and he's talking to the Ephesians, the saints, that God has blessed us 
with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now the term in the heavenly places is a big term Paul uses also in the book. We'll see it I think five times throughout the book. But the idea here is that, that heaven is a, is a dimension that's above us and yet we interact with it. And God has given us spiritual blessings and it says every spiritual blessing. In other words, the believer is well equipped to live the spiritual life. Think about Joshua. Joshua was told by God that, that God would be with him and that everyone would fall before him. So he didn't need to worry whether he would win. He just needed to stand up, go forward, and fight because God had already promised the land to him. God had already promised victory to him. He just needed to take possession. And I think we can see here, he says, the Christian, every Christian... Not just a select few, but every Christian is a saint. And it says here that he has been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And that's the key because when you believe the Bible talks about you as in Christ, that now you become a member of his body. And so he says you have those blessings in him. And then it says just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. In other words, what has God the Father done with regard to salvation? It says here, he's given us every spiritual blessing, and then it uses the word he has chosen us. Now sometimes some of the versions use the word elect, and that's certainly uh, the Greek word that is used here. So he's saying that God the Father has chosen those to be in Christ. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So notice this is a sovereign work of God that he made the choice in one verse in John chapter 16, a little different context, but still the same idea. Jesus said to the disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And so here we see that God has chosen these people before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him and then I take the word in love to go with that sentence there in other words God has chosen individuals and then God has a purpose for them that they might be holy and blameless before him in love that they would love him so we see this election of God and we see this purpose of God that they would be holy and blameless before him. We might ask, what is God about? And we'd say God is about doing works of salvation. And the works of salvation are in part through his selection or his election. And the purpose or the goal is that we would be holy and blameless. In another verse in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, it says, He whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So we could say God has elected individuals and then he's predestined them to a purpose that they would be conformed to the image of his Son, that we might be like Christ. So when we say, what's, what's God doing? God is calling people to himself. God is bringing people to himself. And then he is molding them and making them like Christ. You see the idea here? They don't have to wonder if they're going to win. They're going to win. Because it's the work of God that began before the foundation of the world that's going to end up in glory. So he's saying then, take possession and walk in a manner worthy of your calling. Verse 5, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. And so he expands a little bit more on the idea of chosen, and now he says predestined. Chosen has the idea of uh, choosing individuals. Predestined has the idea of purposing a result, and the result is the adoption as sons. Now the adoption of sons could be meaning to be recognized as an adult or it could mean the idea of being recognized as a child of God. And I think that's probably the idea here. He's saying that God has taken people, we'll say, out of the world and he's brought them into his family and made us to be sons and daughters adopted to him. And then some people say, well, well what's behind it? How does this work? 
Well, it's certainly not uh, random, it's not chaotic, but it is according to the kind intention of his will. And then verse 6 says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In other words, this is a refrain in this particular paragraph, which is really one sentence, where three times at the end of the work of each one of the persons, it says, to the praise of, here it says, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Later on, it'll say, to the praise of his glory. And then later on, it'll say, to the praise of his glory. So in other words, in this particular introduction here to the book, what he's saying is, bless God, because he has blessed us to the praise of the glory of his grace. In other words, who's the one that receives the glory in salvation? God is the one. Think about in other verses where it says, let him who boasts, what? Boast in the Lord. What does it say in Jeremiah? I think in Jeremiah it says something like, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might, let not the rich man boast of his wisdom or his riches, but let him who boasts, boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. So in other words, the work of God, the work of the Father, as we would say, an electing work, it's not a work that you and I are meritorious. It's a work where God freely bestows grace. Some might say, well, but maybe he elected the good. But the Bible says there aren't any good. Then some will say, well, maybe he elected those who would believe. But the Bible says there's none who seeks for God. There's none who understands. So there's nobody that's going to believe unless God draws them. Remember in John 6, it says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So you see, what I want us to focus on here is that when we think about salvation, we should say, thank you, God. You receive the glory because it's your work. And we are thankful to you. Let's go on to the work of the Son. Look in verse 7. In Him we have redemption through His blood. In other words, what did the Son do? The Son paid the price. He redeemed us. That's the idea. It says, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according, or the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of of his grace. Jesus is the redeemer. From the beginning of the Bible through the end of the Bible, there's this idea, the need for the payment for sins. Remember in the book of Leviticus, it says in chapter 17, for I have given, uh, what does it say? For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. In other words, God just cannot by edict forgive people. God is a just God, and God requires a payment for sins. And Jesus is the Redeemer. He has paid the penalty. And so here it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the rich of his, of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to the kind intention which he purposed in him. Now the word mystery is a big word also in the book. I think it's used five times. And he has mysteries. And mysteries are not in the sense of like a dramatic, scary novel. But it's the idea of something that wasn't revealed before that is going now to be revealed. And so in a sense what he's saying here is that God is revealing things that in the Old Testament were not clear. Now it's always been clear that there would be a Messiah. It's always clear that a Messiah would pay the penalty for sins. It's even clear that Gentiles would be forgiven. But it wasn't clear in Ephesians, he's going to say, that he's made Jew and Gentile into one new man, into one body. And here, it, I don't think is clear. I think he's probably referring to the millennium, where he says in verse 10, with a view to the administration or the dispensation suitable to the fullness of the times, that is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on the earth. 
In other words, he's saying that there's a, a day ahead. Now, the, d the debate is, is this referring to the millennium or is this referring to the eternal state? I think it's probably referring to the millennium, but what he's saying here is there's a day ahead when everything in earth and on heaven is going to be subjected to Christ and he's going to be over all things. Now, if you read the Old Testament, you certainly see the promise of a great age. You see the promise that, that the, the wolf is going to lay down with the lamb. You see the promise that the lion is going to eat straw. You see the promise that the child's going to play by the hole of the serpent and it won't, it won't hurt him. But the idea, though, is it all subjected to and underneath the authority of the Messiah. I, I don't think that's totally clear. And so here what he's saying here is now God is revealing that all of these things ahead are subject to Messiah and he's going to be all in all and all are going to be submissive to him and he is the redeemer. I think that's the sense of what he's saying. And then it says in verse 10, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. Now that certainly could be the right translation, but it could also be translated, we were made his inheritance. And so if that's the sense of it, it's saying that we're predestined to be God's inheritance. Now in a sense you could say, well, you know, maybe he's not getting that good a deal out of it. <laughs> but remember in Romans chapter 8, remember it says, whom he foreknew, these he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. In other words, what God is doing is God is making you like Christ. Now that's a great thing. Now if you have children, or if you have grandchildren, you, you can sit back and you can enjoy them. Particularly, I've had some time recently with grandchildren, you can enjoy them and just, just watch them. They are, they are fun to watch. There's a few other things going on sometimes too, but they are fun to watch. They are a delight to the eyes and you can enjoy them and they give pleasure to you. And here what it's saying here is if, if, if the translation is correct, we are his inheritance, predestined to be his inheritance, that God takes delight in people that he makes like Christ. And I think that's probably the sense of what the passage means here. And it says, who works all things after the counsel of his will. In other words, we don't know exactly why God does what he does, but I think what we do know, though, is we do, that he does things according to the counsel of his will. And we do know that God, as I think Einstein said, doesn't play or roll dice with the universe. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus said, Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. In other words, God is a God who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So there, there's not this idea of random, chaotic things that happen. Even the Proverbs say the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So God is a God who works things according to the counsel of his will. And in verse 12 it says, To the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. And that's probably talking about Paul referring to himself as a Jew. And then he says, we're to the praise of his glory, but also Gentiles as well. And notice how the section ends with to the praise of his glory. Now let's go to verse 13 and this is the last section in this We'll call it one long sentence. In him. Now remember back in verse 7 it began with in him. And now here in verse 13. In him you also after listening to the message of truth. Now it's talked about the work of God in electing. It's talked about the work of God in redeeming. Dying on the cross. Shedding his blood. Paying the price. And here it says something, it says, in him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, it says, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed. Now, it's important, and I think it's balanced here, because it says, you believed. Now, we talk about the work of God, but here it says, you need to receive that work. 
And how do you receive the work? You hear the message. Faith comes by hearing. In hearing by the word of Christ, you hear the message. But you have to respond. And it says, having believed. Well, what happened when you believed? You were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit seals you. Now he does more than that too. I believe he draws you. I believe that the Bible teaches that he calls you. We could look at another verse that's very similar in 2 Timothy. It says that you've been chosen by God from the beginning through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. In other words, God chooses. And here it says the Spirit sanctifies. And then it says you have faith in the truth and faith in Christ and his death as the payment for sins. And so when that happens, it says then you're sealed in him. Now what does it mean to seal? Well, in the ancient world, a king or a person in authority would have a seal. Oftentimes it would be a ring. And so he might put his seal on something to show that he owned it. And that's certainly what it could mean here. Think about the word hallmark. What does the word hallmark mean? It would mean a mark that was put on a, a piece of metal to show that it was the genuine article. So here it could either mean ownership or it could mean validation that it's the genuine article. Or it could even mean security. Remember when Pilate sealed the tomb of Jesus with his seal to make it secure. But the idea here is that the Holy Spirit seals that person who believes. And that person who believes then has the mark of God's ownership, the mark of authenticity, and the security of being God's possession. That's what God the Holy Spirit does. And in Ephesians later in the book it says that you're sealed with the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. In other words, God's not going to lose you. God's going to keep you. God's going to keep you if you trusted in him. And notice how even in other places in the Bible it teaches that in John chapter 10 verse 27, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish. And he says later on, he says, my father who has given them, given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. In other words, God does a great work, and you and I receive that work by faith. Now, sometimes when we talk about something like this, somebody might say to themselves, but you know, I don't know. Am I, am I elect? I don't know. Have I been selected? I don't know that. Well, I would say to you, you can know that. And there's a passage in John chapter 6 and verse 37. Jesus said, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. Do you want to know if you're elect or not? What I would say is, have you come to Christ? And what does it mean to come to Christ? Jesus said in John 6, he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. And he who believes in me will never thirst. What does it mean to come? In that very verse, he says it means to believe. And what does it mean to believe? It means to trust in what he has done. Have you trusted in what Christ has done? You see, I read something this week. It was interesting by some uh, theologian, Niebuhr, and I think what he said is the modern man believes in a God who has no wrath. And he believes in men who have no sin. And he believes in a kingdom that has no judgment. And he believes in a Christ who had no cross. And you see, that's totally opposite of what the Bible teaches. But the Bible does teach that God is a just God. And he's a holy God. But it teaches that he's a gracious God. And that he's a loving God. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so what I would say to you, when you look at a passage like this this morning, think about 
we see the work of God and we can and should thank God for what he has done and we should say to the praise of his glory because he's the one that did the work and we should say what have I done I have received what he did for me and then bless God as the writer says bless God who has blessed us but then also, though, think about the theme of the book. Why does he say, why does he spend so much time telling you what God did? Because he wants you to know the certainty and the greatness of your calling. That, that, that you are important to God. Jesus said, you're much more important than many sparrows. Now that's a figure of speech, but the point is, obviously you're more important than sparrows. But that's why he says it that way. You're more important than many sparrows. You are important to God. God has elected you from the foundation of the world. Christ has shed his blood on the cross to pay for your sins. The Holy Spirit has sealed you unto the day of redemption to the praise of his glory. If you believed. So I would say, have you believed? And if you believe, then you can say, God has done this. I thank God for his calling me in the greatness of his calling. And now since you realize, Paul wants you to realize you're a saint by calling. Then how should you live? Should you live like a dog or should you live like a saint? You tell me. What does the Bible say? The Bible says you're a saint. And he says, live like a saint. And what I would say is, think of old Joshua back there. He didn't have to pray that God would give him the land. God already gave him the land. He didn't have to pray that God would give him victories. God promised he would give him victories. What does he say to him again? He says, no man will be able to stand before you. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. So he didn't have to pray for victory. What do you have to do? Just go out and fight. Because God had already promised the victory. And what I'm saying is God has given the Christian every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So you and I have the authority and the power and the resources to live the life God wants us to live. So think about the fact you're a saint. That ought to encourage you. You're a saint. That shouldn't make you lazy. That should encourage you. Joshua shouldn't have been lazy because God had given him the promises. God should be encouraged. Or Joshua should be encouraged. You know, I didn't know if I was going to say this, but I'm just going to divulge just a bit here. You know, I'm a Cub fan. And, and some may not like that, but since we've had a few down years since the great year, you know, you can still accept it a little more. But you know, after the Cubs won the World Series... There's a member of my family, a very close, immediate member of my family, I won't mention any names, that, that watched Game 7 the last couple innings many times over, many times over. Why did they do that? To see who would win? They already knew who was going to win. As a matter of fact, you know what? There were terrible things that happened. Our star pitcher, their team, hit a home run off, us, off of him and it looked like it was going to be the greatest debacle and disaster in history of baseball but you know what it wasn't and they still won so why would you keep watching it again if you already know the outcome because you enjoy it and you know what can't you enjoy the fact that God has done these great things and he's already told you you're gonna win and can't that help you a little bit when you have challenges and struggles and trials along the way? Because it does say all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And it says in the world you have tribulation. But he says be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So what I'm saying is he says God's done a great thing. Now it doesn't mean there aren't challenges along the way. But it does mean, even if you know the final score, you can enjoy the game because you know who's going to win. And what I'd say here is think about the Christian life. God's predestined, called, and will glorify. Christ has shed his blood to redeem, and the Holy Spirit has sealed you. God's done great things.
Walk in a manner worthy of your calling. Let's pray. Lord, what can we do but say thank you? We can say bless God for he has blessed us. Bless you God. And if there's one here this morning who says, I don't know that I, I've trusted in Christ. I, some might even say, I don't know if I'm elect. My friend, the issue is, is, have you come to Christ? Have you trusted in him? Do you believe that he shed his blood to pay your penalty? As the two young People who were baptized, they said, there's nothing in myself that I'm trusting in. I am trusting in what Jesus did for me on the cross. And friend, pray with me. Dear God, there's nothing I can do, but I am trusting that Jesus died on the cross. And I'm trusting that he shed his blood to pay the penalty for all of my sins. I am trusting in him as my Savior. And Father, help each one here today to think, help me to walk, help me to live in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have called me. Help me to realize that I am a saint. And as a saint, help me now to live like it. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.